Good morning, everybody. Aloha from Hawaii. This is Mark Coleman. I'm Mark Coleman. Um, and I'm the co-host today of Talking Tax, our bi-weekly show here on Think Tech Hawaii, where we talk with uh, Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii, about issues of concern locally. Uh, and our topic this week has to do with um, the recently resolved Kalima versus State case. Um, that is a long running case that Tom recently wrote about for the for his column that is posted on the website at the at the uh, Tax Foundation of Hawaii and uh, also published in newspapers statewide. So the, the case essentially involved uh, a long running uh, claim against uh, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands by a class. It was a class action suit and it took decades and they finally resolved it in 2022. These people were alleging, uh, thousands of Hawaiian, Native Hawaiians were alleging that um, the state, the D Department of Hawaiian Homelands, uh, was not meeting its fiduciary responsibility to provide them homesteads on uh, DHHL lands under the 1920, I think it was. Uh, yeah, the Hawaiian Homes Commission, Commission Act of 1920. Yeah. Right. So Tom wrote about this. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, the, the actual title of his article was called Upsetting the Apple Cart in the 24 year in 24 year old litigation it had to do with uh, a one claimant uh filing a, 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 he actually submitted a letter at the very last minute before the, all the money was supposed to be handed out to the claimants uh they had ruled in their favor and they were supposed to all get some money um but he filed uh, he, and when he found out he was only going to get zero nothing he filed a letter with the court and was disputing you know his situation and that threw the thing into upsetting the apple cart, as Tom said. So, Tom, I'm, I'm curious. And then, as you point out in your article, Tom, uh, the Supreme Court jumped in and uh, in in October and ruled that Mr. Rivera, Ricky Rivera's uh, claim to, to be owed something uh, didn't have any standing because he was too young at the time that he filed the, the claim. Um, so what was exactly your issue that the, the supreme court ruled you know throughout his case they said he had a right to file that but that basically he had no he didn't win so um now everybody's going to get their money and i i was curious why you wrote about it was it the was it the hold up uh because of that one letter or were you or was it more the general issue that this case has taken so long well it's it's it's, it's kind of both of those things but um it, I, I think, uh, is very instructive that uh, you have something that you know, people, you know, many, many people have worked on for many, many years. And uh, depending on how uh, people approach it, uh, it can all be upset by just one person. And let me kind of give you some background on uh, what's going on here. As you as you correctly pointed out, this is a class action. It was filed in 1999, before the turn of the century, <laughs> by by a, a number of beneficiaries, you know, Native Hawaiians who, under our uh, Statehood Act and Hawaiians, the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, which is a federal act in 1920, um, uh, the Fed ceded them, uh, you know, ceded some lands to. Be distributed to to Native Hawaiians, uh, you know, for uh, for various purposes, and there's been a problem getting uh, that land to these people. Uh, it's 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 taken decades, yeah, and, and and people have literally died while while on the wait list. Right, it's, it's been a huge problem. Over over several years, and earlier this year, uh, we thought that this 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 travesty was going to be you know, finally come to an end when you know, the state and uh, the beneficiary class reached a settlement, and uh, uh, the uh, you know the the judge presiding over the case uh, was really happy about it. Um, and and she had a uh, a hearing uh, to 
basically consider the fairness of the settlement and, you know, of, of course would take uh, anybody's input uh, into consideration when ruling on the fairness of the settlement. And, and this, is, this is basically how class actions work. Uh, well, what happens is somebody files a claim early in the, you know, early in the litigation that, you know, we, we start by uh, people who call themselves class plaintiffs. They file a suit on behalf of themselves and other people. And, what, and the, basically the first major part of the litigation is establishing the class that these people represent. So it can be like a suit against a, uh, you know, a, a company for securities fraud. It can be, um, you know, a, a, a suit against a, like a telephone company for allegedly leaking uh, personal information where it shouldn't have gone. Uh, there are all kinds of cases where class actions can be brought. And once the, once the court certifies the class, which means they say, okay, uh, these, these, this is not a, a lawsuit involving you know, just the, uh, the, the particular plaintiffs who brought the action, but uh, for a whole class of people who are described in the class certification order, okay, it then becomes a vehicle for anybody who is within the class to uh, share in the, uh, in, in the lawsuit and, uh, and the, in the relief, if any, that's then brought against or, that, or that's paid. So, so typically you have class actions where, you know, individual people may get like less than a hundred bucks each, but there's like millions of them. So, right. so those settlements still tend to make news because they're multi-million dollars. Uh, once everybody's added up. So this was one of them. Uh, this is a typical class action suit, but, it, but again, it goes back to 1999. Uh, and it's definitely before, um, you know, many of, many of us who were involved in the, uh, you know, reporting of this case were even born. Uh, right. Not me, of course, but. <laughs> or me. Or me. Yeah. So, so we go through the process, and I think it's un important to understand how the process works for, you know, people who are, you know, considering class actions or is, or have been a part of class actions. You know, once the class is certified, uh, the court sends notice to everybody who's in the class, and they have then the right to opt out if they want to and bring you know bring a lawsuit themselves or stay with the class and uh, participate in the uh, relief that is offered to the class. Now that, that is usually, uh, you know, for, for people who have small claims, uh, it's, it's a lot more uh, resource efficient because you don't need a lawyer. Uh, the, the, law, the lawyer is basically hired by the class and yeah, the lawyer is getting some major bucks, but yeah. but it's uh, you know millions of claims, yeah, or or at least not not millions, but uh, uh, claims too numerous to you know to to deal with individual suits. I mean, here we had a class of twenty five hundred beneficiaries at the yeah. time the litigation started, right? So it was right. still a you know kind of a big number, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and like I said, uh, the class and the state were about to reach a settlement, um, $328 million they agreed upon earlier in the year, and uh, the judge held a hearing on the fairness of the settlement, which notice of which was given to all class members, and she approved the settlement. Which, which means that it was okay for um, beneficiaries to start getting their money. Okay, but then this happened. And what, what I mean by this is that a single person wrote a letter, and his name was Ricky Rivera. He wrote a letter saying, 
I wish to file an appeal before the deadline of August 31st, 2023. The appeal is limited to the issue of special master and claim administration uh, failing to process my claim in a timely fashion. That's all the letter said. It's, he signed his name. Oh. So, like the like the judge and the you know the attorneys looking at that and saying, you know, what the heck is this? And they didn't really you know they didn't really quite know how to deal with it. Um, so, uh, so the judge did something, um, what I thought was fairly reasonable and said, okay, let's have a hearing, uh, and invite this guy and figure out what he really wants. And, it, and it, for, at first it seemed, um, that everybody's going to go along with it. But then the state suddenly changed its mind and said, no, 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 you can't do that. Because the letter says it's an appeal. And when an appeal is filed, the appellate court has to sort things out. And the trial court loses jurisdiction. So everything at the trial court must stop, is what the state said. And... Um, this uh, kind of uh, annoyed the judge to no end because, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a, a, a person who didn't have a lawyer. Uh, it's it's not a notice of appeal in proper form, but but you got to give some leeway to people who aren't lawyers. And... Um, and so here's what the judge said about it. You know, if any case demands that counsel bring to bear the full measure of their experience, expertise, and talents to develop and consider strategies for a thoughtful, constructive, creative, and legally competent resolution short of disposition by the appellate court is this one. The state sees otherwise. Even though the state cannot articulate any real-world risk in the distribution of settlement proceeds short of withdrawal of the letter or disposition by the appellate court. Ultimately, however, it's the state's refusal to advise this court if it would initiate its own appellate action if the court ordered the transfer of funds, thereby even further delaying the class member's receipt of those funds, that ensures there will be no resolution at this stage. In light of the state's just announced objection and its refusal to disclose what action it might take thereafter, the risk of even more delay is too significant to move forward. Huh. So, so, well, so the judge, so, it, so the judge kind of in your article that you were pretty uh, pessimistic. You know, I think you wrote this before the Supreme Court ruled initially, and then that you, you know, you were kind of upset about now it's going to take forever. Uh, apparently you know it already took this long now we're going to have to go through more and more so you were calling the state's position intractable were you surprised uh, how quickly things rolled after that i was surprised i mean usually um appellate cases in the hawaii system take years um how do you think it how do you think it occurred that it, it moved up so quickly to the supreme court you think somebody, I mean, people were talking about it? Well, yeah, we got to get this over with, or what? Uh, that may be. I, I'm not really sure how the Supreme Court got wind of it. Um, but it's a good thing that they did. Yeah. Uh, the Supreme Court jumped in and, and basically said, look, um, the class here is limited to those people who uh, could have filed uh, homestead claims as of a certain date. And, and Mr. Rivera... Uh, was 17 at the time. So he couldn't have filed any claim. He had to be 18 or older. You know, it sounded like he, I, I was reading the documents, or some of them anyway, and it sounded like he actually, maybe I'm wrong, but it sounded like he, he, he was a claimant and he didn't act until he, I think they must have informed all the beneficiaries or the winners of the suit, uh, the, the class action plaintiffs, how much each of them were going to get, and when he saw he was going to get nothing, that's when he filed his appeal. Is that does that make sense? Uh, that may be. 
Yeah. Um, but you know, if he was, but, but that wasn't the only letter he wrote. I mean, he, he wrote other letters to the appellate court and stuff like that. The uh, Supreme Court's opinion refers to some of those. And um, then the idea that he was just so, you know, hey, dude, you're not old enough. You, 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 you weren't legally qualified to be a plaintiff from the very beginning. How come? How could he? Why would he go to the trouble to dispute that? I mean. If it was so quickly disposed of, what was, I don't even understand why it got that far. What do you think? Well, I, I think um, there was probably a lack of understanding as to what the qualifications were to be in the suit. I mean, he thought, well, look, I'm, I'm Native Hawaiian, uh, therefore I'm, I'm entitled to be in this. You know, which is, you know, per perhaps a reasonable assumption. Yeah, it made me made me wonder uh, that you know now that they've gotten that cleared up, the Supreme Court ruled that he's his his case is put aside, and now they can go ahead and distribute the money. As you mentioned, there was um, five thousand. Was it was it thirty? What was the number? How many uh, people were in that lawsuit? A couple uh, thousand. Couple thousand. Uh, Three thousand, and a bunch of them already died. Uh, over a thousand died already, um, or more. And but what about Claimants who, 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 what about others that are still on the list? I mean, there's those people got money for having to wait for years to get their homesteads, and probably many of them never did. And so that must have been the basis of their claims that we're not getting the money, but we're owed something, or we're not getting the land, but so we're owed something. That was basically what they're saying. And then the state said, uh, the court said, okay, yeah, you guys are owed some money. Uh, for your troubles of waiting, you should have had something all along. But since you've had to wait, and and the and the ruling said that here's your money now. We're we're released of all the claims against the state. You know you can't sue us again. But does that mean they're not on the list anymore? They're not going to get any land, or what does that mean? Do you think? Well, I think um, there there's a long process that's that's kind of being followed to get. Uh, to get homestead lands ready for you know people to live on, I mean right now I I don't know if you were aware of this, but many of the homestead lands are in fairly inaccessible places like yeah. mountains, cliffs, and and that kind of thing. For people to actually live on them, you have to kind of get some basic infrastructure in there, like you know water, power, uh, sewage. That's always been the excuse, and and I guess we could get into that. I I I I've always, I've you know, there's when they set up this thing, there were like 20 when they originally started, there were 24,000 native Hawaiians. I'm trying to look for that they, that note I wrote here. There were, um, and now there's, um, and at the time, there we go, um, and now there's 27,000, I think. Um, I think it's actually more. And and there, and there's still ten thousand people on the list. Let's see. Oh, gee. Okay, it's in in twenty twenty one in nineteen twenty one, there were twenty four thousand people that qualified under the under the act, and um, now there there is ten thousand beneficiaries on Hawaiian homestead lands, and another twenty seven thousand on the wait list. There's twenty seven thousand people, so there's thirty seven thousand people, I guess, total considered to be Native Hawaiians that. Are. So yeah, your point about what's taken—it's been a hundred years, and and these people and they still don't have all the Hawaiians on the land. Um, I I wonder what you know. What's the holdup? The excuse I keep hearing is that well, we don't have the infrastructure, and they've got to build them to build the home. They got to have the water lines and the power lines. But what? But I think I might be mistaken. But I think the original idea. Uh, was that just give the land to the Hawaiians, you know, and let them figure it out. Um, if they need, if they need water, they'll, you know, maybe that would be an incentive to figure something out. I, I don't know, but if you have to wait for the Department of Homelands to do this, and instead of letting them just live on the land and figure it out, they, they, they're leasing. Yeah, it. well, I think, I think they're, they've uh, rejected. Uh, you know, just give them raw land as as an option. Uh, 
I think they came, they came to the conclusion some time ago that they, get, they have to provide basic infrastructure. Then uh, their defense over several decades has been, oh, you know, we have permitting delays. Um, we couldn't build on it even if we wanted to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know, with the with the permitting situation that we have here on many of the uh, many of the islands, that's uh, I mean that that doesn't sound like it's a lie. No, I I I, I, I I've heard too uh, when I was doing a little research on it way back when that uh, one issue was that they would um, that sometimes they would award land to certain people and the people would say, oh no, I really don't want that parcel. You know, and so they'd go back on the list to wait for a better one. Um, that might be, I'm not really sure. Um, <clears throat> but so so what it sounds like with this case is that the state basically is giving people money instead of, you know, making them wait forever to get the land. <clears throat> does that does that hint that maybe a solution for the remaining people that are on the wait list? Um why not give all of those folks an option like this as well? Well, I mean, they, they've been trying to do uh, other creative things, uh, as I understand, like um, giving them mortgage assistance or rental assistance, uh, even if they're not on homestead land. Mm, mm-hmm. um, because like, part of the deal was that, yeah, they get a parcel, but it's got to be in homestead land. And there are designated tracts uh, where this is supposed to happen. Right. But, but like I said, you know, some of the, some of these uh, you know tracks are, are are not accessible, and, it, and it's going to take some work to uh, you know to make them accessible and make them you know fit for human habitation. Well, you know, they got six hundred million dollars a year or two ago, and and then another huge amount of money. They've gotten a lot of money lately, and and now I suppose the state will have to cough up. Three hundred twenty-eight more million dollars to to pay off this settlement. Um, you know, where does this all end? Uh, when they do what they what what the feds have told them to do. <laughs> do you think? No. Do you think? I mean, but do you think that that it would be better to just kind of work out something with the claimants, like? divide the land and you know put it in their hands and let them let the individual claimants uh divide it up somehow and just be done with it well i, I don't know if that's even an option um uh-huh. right i mean there's there's this federal process to be followed i mean not, I mean, not federal process but a process defined by the uh you know the, the 1920 federal law yeah well my other thought is that is that now we have probably a whole new class of claimants and somebody else could file a lawsuit. We could do this all over again. It could take another 40 years, right, to figure this one out or 30 years. Was it 99? Yeah. Well, well maybe more. Uh, one of the things that we have been complaining about in the past uh, was that we've looked at Department of Hawaiian Homelands and they get money uh, from like the federal government every year and they don't spend it. Uh, they, they've had um, Native Hawaiian block grants uh, under a federal program uh, that was especially created for Native Hawaiians. Um, they had been getting like maybe I think $15 million a year and they couldn't spend it down. Uh, the, the, the excuse they gave at the time, uh, you know, uh, what they told the legislature was, well, we can't get the permits. So, so we can't we can't construct, um, and uh, you know that went on for a while, uh, and then you know finally the legislature said, "All right, heck with this," um, and 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 by the way, there there have been allegations of systematically underfunding uh, DHHL for years, if not decades. Okay, mm-hmm. so the, so I think that was one of the uh, the issues in the suit, and. Um, Ultimately, uh, they got to do their jobs. The state has to do their job. Uh, that has been uh, they've been tasked with with you know you know back to statehood and before. Well, I you know I know we were going to essentially talk about the Kalima case and 
rather than we are talking about the Kalima case. I know about uh, and but specifically about that. But you know, we we went broader focus here with the uh, DHHL's mission. What what is the, the, the uh, when you say well they just got to do their job? What is how do they do it? How can they do it? They've never they've had a hundred years. You know, I, I just think it's a broken system. Period. Uh, I think they ought to go. You know what I think maybe doesn't really matter, but I my preference would be to see these uh, people just be given the land, let them homestead it, like you know, become fee simple owners. But it just seems to me like there's an interest in keeping them as wards of the state, the Native Hawaiians. It it seems like that to me, um, and and we're just going to be in for more and more of this bureaucratic delay for for another century, um, with more claimants, more people dying on the waiting list, and. And so on. Does that was that the broader message, or was the you know what was the broader message of your article about the Rivera uh, apple cart issue? What well, one thing I think that uh, that we have to be really wary of is like if you are you know hyper focused on procedure, and and it seems like the attorney generals here were um, that it's it's very easy for a uh, you know, a good, uh, if if perhaps maybe a little bit misguided effort uh, to to get into be a, a real pickle really quickly. Mm. So so I think um, it behooves uh, all of our you know civil servants and government uh, government officers and, and and so forth you know, to 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 try and look at practicalities to try to come up with solutions to problems instead of saying, oh, no, no, the process doesn't work. So, uh, so we got to stop right here. Yes. Right. Because what they did. Right. Um, well, work so, together, huh? Let's all work together. As we say at the Grassroots Institute. Of that's Florida, right. Where I work. Well, thank you very much, Tom. This has been a great discussion about pretty you know, arcane subject. Any last word? Well, I, like I said, I, I hope that uh, this settlement will be done quickly and, and that um, cooler heads will prevail in kind of further, uh, you know, the, the further mission of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands. Right on. Well, thank you very much, Tom. In, enjoying being here with you again. And thank you very much for all our viewers for being here. I hope you learned something today and had a good time watching. Uh, hope to see you again. Aloha.